Well, we're getting there. We're almost 1,100. Remember, we were just 1,000. So, okay. Well, we're amazing. Well, let's analyze. Okay. So, I want, I want people to understand this. This move, folks, is so deep that I think I'm going to save this for when we're 3,000. Then I might talk about it and people might actually understand. And now, let's skip this for now. Uh, let's just play another game. Those of you thinking, all right, when is Daniel going to finally get to like, you know, 1600s and 2000s? And, and it's an honor to have so many different people. But the thing that I want to point out before I, I, I jump in is that I'm only doing one of these. Okay, this is this is going to be like an opus magnum. You know, I'm not going to do seven speedruns. I'm not going to do various kinds of speedruns. I've sort of decided to do this one speedrun and I want to do it really, really well. I want to do it the best that I possibly can. And it's going to take a long time for me to get through the levels and so I, I want to target every single level I know that my audience is very diverse there's beginners there's advanced players and it is a slower run I realize that it's a bit of a spoof the name um, but just wanted to clarify that so everybody's on the same page and we've got Sunni uh, Sumi 2099 okay mate I hope that's not his rating uh, so we're still gonna go e5 um, and okay Queen f3 so this guy I think is loading up the scholars mate Bishop c4 drum roll please there we go. And you guys already know that, that when, when, when this kind of stuff happens, you, what you want to do is you want to develop your pieces and simultaneously prevent these threats. You don't want to go queen e7. You don't want to go queen f6. Just go knight f6. You don't want to pre-move, okay? When you see this kind of stuff, you don't want to pre-move. Okay, so he thinks he's cool right now. And because we're at a slightly more advanced level, my responses to these kind of kinds of things is going to be a little bit more advanced. Now he's threatening bishop takes f7, so the knee-jerk response would be queen e7. But recognize that after bishop takes f7, we've talked about this, the queen is the worst defender because when it's attacked, it has to respond to that. How can we attack the queen such that after bishop f7, king e7, this queen is going to be overloaded? What move can we make? And we've made this move many times before in these types of positions. It's, it's a typical way to, to attack the queen in such positions. We, we aren't afraid to play knight d4. Now this is a move you have to play if you if you're fully, you know, confident in this type of position in your calculation, uh, and it definitely comes as a surprise to him. So I will talk through this after the after the three games in more detail. But basically, your bishop f7, king e7, queen has to stay on this diagonal, which is very hard to do because this knight is guarding d5. Now those of you who are trying to practice your visualization, if bishop f7, king e7, and queen c4. How do we continue harassing the queen and forcing it off that diagonal? How do we force that queen off the diagonal? Okay, we'll talk about that after the game. Beautiful, everybody sees it. Now, this is a big chance for us because he hasn't developed any of his pieces. It's a golden opportunity for us to strike while the iron is hot. So how do we rip open the center? And when I say strike while the iron is hot, what I really mean is opening up the center. That is the gateway to so many different tactics. What does that mean? What move does that actually entail? Let's go. And I'm, ma I'm making this move really without any calculation. I'm just striking because I'm absolutely sure that with a queen on, like this on d3, this is not going to go over well for him. In fact, let's calculate. e takes d5. Knight takes d5 is entirely possible, but we have a, a move that basically wins the game. What do we do? What do we do? My favorite question to ask you. But this is a very simple move. And by this point, we've dealt with so many of these openings. This should kind of be instinctual for most people. And it is. Bishop f5. Very good. Everybody's seeing it. He has to move his queen. We take on c2. And we win a rook. And we're ahead of development. And he's got to move his king. Lots of bad stuff happening here for white. In fact, um, Tamok asks a, a great question. I'm going to note this down. And I'm going to answer this while we're doing the autopsy after the game. Oh, whoa. <laughs> okay. All right. I think he wants to give us a check on b5. I think he's attracted by this check. I can almost guarantee you he's going to give us this check, but maybe not. I mean, the fact that he's thinking tells me he's realized that something is amiss. I'm afraid that it is a little bit too late, folks. Uh, this move d5, I've noted it down. I will explain it. How, ex how did I know when to open the center and when, when to develop? How do I know that? Um, Tamak asked that great question. I'm going to try to answer that. And there's no generalized answer, but I'm going to try to provide some tips. Okay, let's take the pawn. We're up a full queen. The rest is very simple. One piece of advice I've shared before that I'd like to repeat. When you are up a full queen, 
you do not need to worry about defending every single pawn. So in this position, I know a lot of you are thinking f6. I don't want to play f6. I don't want to weaken this diagonal. All right, forget this pawn. Let him take it. Also, don't play bishop d6 because that leaves the knight exposed. So can somebody give me a very zen move that f just ignore this pawn and keep developing? What does that mean? Which move am I having my eye on? Yeah, bishop c5. Very nice, Zaraf. Bishop e7 would have been good too. Queen d6 would have been a little bit too clunky, right? You're using the queen to defend a pawn. And as I've said before, try, be very careful about using a piece like the queen to perform a very small task like defending a pawn. So this is going to be so much easier. He's won a pawn, but we've completed our development. He's probably going to castle because of our central overall. <laughs> All right, well, this is just asking for it. So what do we do? Yeah, Travman, I could have done that too, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about that after the game. Rook e8, exactly. Bishop b4 instead of bishop c5. I'm just noting this down. Very good. And, uh, it, it, you know, I know that, you know, people joke profit and stuff. Like, I, I didn't know that by sacking on e5, we're going to actually use that for our benefit by opening the e-file. I thought he would castle, but sometimes, you know, giving up a pawn has unforeseen benefits. All right, we're going to take this. Now, this is another pretty instructive moment. I know we're up a queen and it's completely winning. What should we take with here? What should we take with here? And remember those of you asking questions, which are all great, by the way, I'll address every single one of them after the three games are played. We're gonna take with a knight, why? Why don't we take with a rook with check? Because we already know the phrase, the threat is stronger than the execution. Here, we are preparing a discovered check. A discovered check is a lot stronger than taking with the rook and telling our opponent, okay, you're gonna to have to move your king because here he has moved his king, but he's moved it from the frying pan into the fire. The king is pinned. Well, sorry, the pawn is pinned. It cannot move. So it's not actually defending this bishop, so we can just take it. And you see that the discover check is one of the strongest tactical assets that you can have in any position. That doesn't mean it's always good, but in a position like this with a wide open king, you definitely wanna set up a discovery. All right, two more games, and then I'll talk about all three of them. Let's move on to the next one. Very nice game. And we're playing Ali Reza Ferruja. Okay. That's a pretty scary name, I'm not gonna lie. If it was if there was an A-L-I in front of his name, I would have gotten a little bit more scared. Okay, so let us diversify a little bit. And let's play some other openings. We have been playing the Italian. All right, well, never mind, because he's not letting us do anything. So what do we do in this position? The king is the penny, exactly. We have to publish a book of the terminology. Can somebody remind me what move have what move do we play against the Philidor? We played d4. Why do we play d4? Because by playing d6, e, a has not developed a piece. B, he's obstructed his bishop. Both of these things are serious concessions, which means that to exploit them, we open up the center. Another typical situation. Do not rush to move this knight. We can just develop because once he takes this knight, this queen is perfectly safe because he no longer has a knight on b8 to attack our queen with. C5 is a very typical move for a lot of players in this position. But do not assume that attacking the queen is just going to be a naturally good thing. We'll talk about that after the game. But the move C5 is a very classic mistake in these types of positions. How do we continue our development? What would be the most active way of now proceeding? And just, a, you know, very natural move. But I just want to kind of help everybody practice your, your sort of sense for where the pieces belong, so to speak. Exactly. Bishop c4. Pressuring the f7 pawn. He's probably going to bring his knight out, and we're just going to continue our development. We don't need to move our queen anywhere. Our queen is perfectly safe. In fact, we are trying to provoke the move c5. And the main issue with that move, since he's thinking I can talk about this, uh, is going to be that he weakens the d5 square. And that is a central square that you certainly do not want to weaken permanently. Okay, let's castle. He's probably going to go knight c6. Big deal. He's attacking our queen. Well, we move the queen. Where should we move the queen? And here we've got to be very careful. I know that a lot of people, I know it, que we're going to see somebody say queen d5. And that's tempting. But be very careful about moving your queen into too much traffic. Queen d5 might allow bishop e6. Queen d3 might allow knight e5. And I don't want to part ways with this bishop. So I'm going to do something here that some people, ah, really, you're so lame, Dan. Queen d1, come on, man. Queen d1. And sometimes you have to retreat. That doesn't mean we've done anything wrong. In fact, our position is so incredibly active and uh, we can continue to activate our pieces 
but it's okay to make the occasional retreating move. That doesn't mean anything. So how do we continue activating our pieces? We have a beautiful outpost for one of our pieces. What piece am I talking about? We can develop this bishop, that's fine, but I'm thinking about a particular outpost. Let's get this knight over to the center. Let's get this knight over to the center. Look at this beautiful square. We can take the bishop at our leisure, but we're not going to because this knight is very strong. We're gonna to try to make him be the one to take this knight. And I really like the proposal of hidden king. Let's increase our central control by playing f4. That's not necessarily the move that I would make uh, in a game that I would play, but I wanna show people how to attack like this. Okay, so we haven't completed our development, which is not a situation that I like particularly. And here is a good example of when to maneuver. Now we, we look at this bishop for a second, okay? We can put it on e3. Is it really doing anything on e3? We could be getting more bang for our buck. Where should the bishop go? And this will look like a very awkward move initially, but it's, it's a maneuver, right? We make an awkward move, but then the bishop maneuvers to a good square. Boom. Zaraf, that's the right idea. I don't want to play b3 because that weakens the long diagonal. But the idea is the same. We're getting our bishop. Look at this. We're, we're reading his mind because we're not thinking about the immediate square. We're thinking about the long-term square. Now we get the bishop to the long diagonal and we have an extra knight. And this is not a coincidence. I've, told, I've said this before. When we play like this, we piss our opponent off. I mean, we annoy him. Okay, what should we do? He's attacking our, our knight. We already know that there are two main methods of trying to convert extra material. Believe it or not, we can actually make a move that doesn't involve moving the knight. This is one of those things that you just gotta kind of think about. Because we have so many active pieces, gotta start thinking about how to, how to set threats. Bingo, Zaraf is on fire, queen d4 attacking the pawn. If he plays bishop f6, then we get a chance to trade everything in one fell swoop. Okay, it allows us to deliver checkmate. Um, how do I find a move like 15 queen d4? How do you know to look for it? I'll talk about that after the game. Let me just open up the window. And we see different openings. We see the French. Now, the opening that I really like to play against the French to illustrate conceptual, I wanted to say conceptual concepts, that's how I know it's 10 p.m., is the advanced French. And the advanced French causes trouble to a lot of French players because it leads to a close position. Now, this is a conceptual mistake. We talked about this. He is attacking the tip of the pawn chain rather than the base of the pawn chain. That is wrong in this case and in most cases because what happens when you attack the tip of the pawn chain very often is that look at this square on e5. Now it is a square that we can occupy with a knight. Now it is an outpost that he has granted us. And in addition, we still have nice central control. Now, one very important thing. We don't need to get our knight to e5 immediately. It's just a square that's available to us at some future point. For now, we're just gonna develop our pieces, right? There's no need to, to rush with anything. We can just complete our development at our leisure and he always is gonna have to watch for this. Now he's playing with some serious fire. In addition to allowing us this square in five, he has opened up the e-file, which means that there's a very natural move that we can play now. Thank you, Jay Kushner, for the sub. Knight g5 is a knight g5 is a very good move, but let's play in a more almost stereotypical fashion. Not very creative, but very strong. I mean, it's hard to defend this. Yeah, there we go. And guess what move now this allows? Now this knight has landed on f8 to defend the pawn. So what move now should be considered? And there's a couple of interesting things. Eric, the red, unfortunately not accepting students at the moment, but I'll talk about that. Knight g5, okay, but knight g5 doesn't attack the pawn. Let's play in a very methodical fashion. I want to go knight e5, okay? I wanna go knight e5. The problem with knight e5 is you might take it. So I want to get this bishop out of d6. I wanna trade it. So what we're gonna do, and this is a move I'm gonna make and explain later, is go bishop g5. There's two principal reasons for this. First of all, I'm developing my bishop to a very active square, good. Second of all, and this is a typical French idea, I'm not pulling this out of my behind. Bishop h4, bishop g3 is going to invite the trade of bishops. Once the bishops are traded, our knight is gonna have free passage to the e5 square. This is another maneuver. Okay, and he's done it, our work for us. This kind of play, once again, yields positive benefits even without us trying to complete our idea. Okay, knight g6, how do we continue? How do we continue? And there's many good moves here. In literature, there's a phrase, kill your darlings. 
which means sometimes you have to get rid of what you love. So I would very seriously consider taking with a knight and then the bishop to force his king out. But because I love this knight too much, I don't want to kill our darlings. Let's go bishop takes g6. And instead of grabbing this pawn with a knight greedily, let's try to take this pawn with something else. What else can we take this pawn with? Or at least try to take this pawn with. And that, in combination with the knight, is going to yield tremendous, tremendous attacking benefits. Let's go here. I've told you guys this at the very beginning of our speedrun. The knight and the queen is the strongest pair of attackers on the chessboard. There is no pair of two pieces, not even a queen and a rook in some regards, that are as strong of attackers as the queen and the knight because of their ability to control squares, because of their ability to defend each other, because of their ability to deliver checkmate. All right, and that's nice how that word coincided with him playing king f8. Okay, we've got a lot to unpack. We're not gonna take too long on this. I wanna do at least one more set of games, but let's jump in to the analysis. Okay, you know, things are going well here. All right, first game, Sumi 2099. I know people are excited to, to look at this game, but we'll get there. Now the move knight d4, let's unpack this for a second. Bishop f7, king e7. One thing to watch out for. Sometimes people forget that the e6 square is undefended. When the e6 square is undefended, <laughs> I know this looks ridiculous right now, but this could be checkmate, okay? So make sure that the e6 square is actually defended when you allow bishop takes f7. He has to play queen c4 to keep his queen protecting. And the move b5 is fitting representation of what's going on here because the queen, the poor queen, has to leave the bishop. It has no more squares on the diagonal. All are protected. King f7, we're up a piece. Now, I am chessman asked about knight a5, which would be also relatively effective. Now, the problem this knight is undefended. I've emphasized the importance of undefended pieces many times. You've got to be very careful about that. What can white do here to save material? He can give a check and trade the bishop for the knight. So in addition to the knight being centralized, it is also defended by a pawn, which greatly raises its appeal. The way I would think about this is in relation to the queen, right? The queen is the easiest piece to attack. So when our opponent has developed his queen early, we can often get away with opening up the center before we have completed our development because our opponent has not completed his. And we already have developed two pieces, right? And he's only developed one. And the queen is like an anti-developed piece. That's actually a negative, net negative. So when our opponent has his queen positioned so awkwardly on a square like d3, that's what really sets off the alarm bells, right? It's that awkward positioning of the queen. Okay, what happens if we open up the center? You calculate a little bit and you see that bishop f5 wins. I know that's not a good answer, but at least hopefully, you know, that can provide some context. And then the only other important moments, right? Ignoring the pawn. We're up a queen. We don't need to do that. We can just develop our bishop. The check on b4 would be fine, but it would allow him to block it with a pawn. So this would not be anything spectacular. We could come back to c5 here. That would be fine. But after knight takes e5, it might allow him to support the knight with d4. Okay, the rest was very simple. Knight takes e3, preparing the discovery and winning another piece, and he resigned. Okay, next game. He played a Philidor, so we played d4. One tidbit that I shared earlier, those of you um, who are here, uh, who have not been here uh, when I talked about this for the first time, uh, but a little trivia question for those of you who have. What is the interesting tidbit about the Philidor? And this is unconfirmed but I'm about 95% sure that this is the case. What is the interesting tidbit I shared about the Philidor the last time one of our opponents played it? Yes, Philidor and J News is correct. Philidor never played it himself. Andre Philidor, 18th century chess pioneer, never actually played the Philidor. I think he just talked about it in his seminal chess work, but that's just an interesting little factoid about the way that chess openings are sometimes named. And uh, Philidor is not a terrible opening, okay? And, and I want to take a second to talk about something that people don't always realize. There's a bunch of these openings, and one opening is called the 5,000-bit opening that Gem Jam just, just played. Holy smokes. Incredible. Incredible. Support. 70 gifted subs over the course of the week, and now unbelievable stuff. Thank you so much for another tremendous bit drop. The absolute legend, the vampire, the pinny, appreciate it. Uh, and um, the Philidor, yeah, Gem Jam, before Gem Jam rudely distracted me from talking about the Philidor with this 5,000 bits, uh, but I appreciate it. Yeah, th there's a misconception that openings like the Philidor, or openings like 
even d5, are, are in some sense absolutely terrible and lose. Or even the move queen e7, which my first coach used to play against me and drive me crazy because it's, this is actually a very hard move to refute. These openings are not losing. They're not terrible. They're just dubious. And the most that white can do if black plays well is get a solid edge, but nothing more than that. So you have to temper your expectations. If your opponent plays something like this, do not go crazy trying to win the game in five moves. It's a lot better to adhere to basic principles and get a small advantage than to go wild and try to win the game quickly. That's exactly what people who play these types of openings want. Okay, so d4 opening up the center, uh, developing our pieces, developing pieces, dropping our queen back to d1. So just to recap, if we go queen d5, um, our queen you know, enters the highway and, and we don't want that, right? It gets into too much trouble. If we go queen d3, we allow knight e5 and, and he roots out our bishop. Um, so we drop the queen back, which is totally fine. Knight d5. And Zaraf asks, in some positions, I try to put a knight on an outpost, but my opponent almost always has something like knight e7 to challenge the knight and I lose the outpost. Any suggestions on how to get the outpost anyways? Well, that's a good question, right? And the fact of the matter is knight e5 is not truly an outpost because we can envision a scenario where he drops his knight away from c6, uh, from c6 and then plays c6 to kick the knight away. The way that you want to think about outposts is in terms of trade-offs, right? You want to envision all the scenarios where he gets rid of the outpost. One of them is the scenario in which he captures the knight on c5. But the fact of the matter is, what do we gain in return for the knight outpost? Well, we get the bishop now on an outpost, which is a pretty darn good outpost. Maybe not as good as the knight. Wouldn't you say this is pretty good? We have the possibility of ruining his pawn structure. We have the possibility of the bishops cooperating. So when you think of chess advantages you want to think of them in a transformational sense you don't want to think of anything as a permanent advantage you want to think of something okay this is an outpost what happens if my opponent tries to trade that outpost can i replace that advantage with something else and that something else can be as as ethereal as time if it takes your opponent four moves to do something that in and of itself is already a reason to do that thing in the first place i don't know if i'm making sense but time is a huge commodity it's like the money of chess okay um, and, and something takes your opponent three or four moves to do, you can use those three or four moves to lift a rook up and then transmute that into, um, into, uh, into an attack. And I have a really good example of that that I just showed one of my students earlier today. I I'm sorry to take so many detours. Let's finish this game and then I'll show it very quickly. Here, we transfer our bishop to the long diagonal where it can sort of cooperate with the other bishop. And of course, he blunders his knight. He sort of, he was intent on playing this move. And so we unwittingly also prevented it, then drop our bishop back, and then we create the threat of queen takes g7. This, as you guys know, is called a battery. When we stack a bishop and a queen on top of each other, it's one of the exceptions to what I was talking about, about not putting the queen into much traffic here. This is more effective than putting the bishop first and the queen second, uh, because we're actually threatening checkmate. Okay, I, I, there were some questions that I missed. Let me just look over the chat for a second. Um, Will there ever be a female chess player like Beth Harmon? Well, I would say that there already was. Uh, and her name was Judith Polgar. And um, people don't always realize this, but Polgar, there's two things to say here. Now, I finished Queen's Gambit two days ago, so I have some more thoughts. Polgar, I think at the highest, yeah, was world number eight. She was, I think, a grandmaster, and grandmaster, not women's GM, but actual grandmaster at 13. And she was, you know, one of the most feared players on the international chess circuit. Her style was incredibly tactical. She was blowing people off the board. She was blowing 2700s off the board regularly. And, um, and just to round off the Beth Harmon conversation, Polgar, uh, my, my longtime coach, Lev Sahis, who now lives in Israel, grandmaster, obviously Russian grandmaster, was also one of the strongest players in the world in the 80s and 90s and, and knows Polgar very well. And, and, and he told me that People I and mean, people hated playing Judith Fogar because of her style. She she was one e four, incredible opening preparation, um, and and just blowing people off the board. Um, and as I understand it, uh, Beth Harmon's main main move was one e four. Although against Borgov, well, some stuff was changed up. Uh, but in in any way, well, thank you, Tyler. Okay. Um, in any case, this is how this game ended. Let me make a very quick detour to show one thing before our last game and before our second speedrun segment. Um, I don't know what the Orthostops Gambit is. Just give me a second, guys. I need to find this game. There's just one moment from a game 
that illustrates the concept of buying yourself time, literally. Okay, and um, this is a pretty high level example, so you know I'm not gonna spend too long on it, but it's important, trust me. We're good, um, so we can go back to this scene. And as you guys can see, this is a game between Spassky and the FM, FM Geller. Yes, Jen, uh, Geller. Uh, yes, her Sarah one's favorite player uh, was playing black here. Yes, exactly. Yes, precisely. Uh, okay, so it is white to play. This was a close Sicilian. This was not Silberg. It was uh, quarterfinal of the candidates. Uh, so this was Spassky's world championship run. Anyways, he's playing white here. It's white to play. And let's very quickly understand what's going on. Now, this is one of those situations where in the close Sicilian, often white attacks on the king side. He tries to get his queen to h4. Those of you who play the Grand Prix attack, this is kind of a sister opening uh, to the Grand Prix attack. Yes, this is a classical game. Now, the problem is that black also has something to say about that. He's attacking on, on the queen side, right? He has the a file. He's got this fianchetto bishop. And if white just willy-nilly plays g4, here's going to be the problem. Black's going to take on a1. Now he's just going to snap that pawn off on g4 exposing the attack on the queen and getting rid of this incredibly valuable knight. So here's what Spassky does. And I won't give this to anybody as a problem. Just be, it's, it, Trust me, I'll give you guys a chance to exercise this. I just want to show this for now. He goes rook c1, which is a move that wouldn't occur to most people because he's voluntarily giving up that a file. Why is he giving up an entire file that he seems to be fighting for? Not only is he giving up the file, Geller, thank you very much, Boris Vasilievich. I'm going to get my rook to a2. And then I'm going to get my queen to a6. And he gets both of his pieces on the a file. Here's the reason he plays this move. The only purpose of this move is to buy himself time. Okay? He's setting up this, ar this fort on c2. Consider this like an army fort. This army fort is staffed with soldiers. And he knows that there are not enough soldiers to last forever. He knows that eventually black is going to get to the c2 pawn. And once he takes that pawn, the dam breaks. The water floods in. But he's buying himself enough time to get such an attack going on the king side that by the time Geller takes that c2 pawn, and he tries, trust me, I'll show you, Spassky is going to be well on the way to checkmating him. Look at what happens. Queen a6, Spassky very methodically, but very quickly, Geller, guess where he's going? He's going to a3. He's going after the pawn. But by the time he gets there, and he has finally gotten there, that is when Spassky goes queen h4. And if he finally takes the pawn here, perhaps you guys can tell me how white wins the game. Okay, maybe I'm taking a long time to talk about something very obvious, but I think this is a very deep concept. Rook takes f6 and mate is inevitable. Geller must move the rook away. Spassky does this anyway. There's a lot of tactics here. He sacks another knight. This is completely winning for black because um, the pieces just pour in and the attack is completely unstoppable. Queen takes g6 is coming. I know that I'm going fast through the details. Just trust me on this. White is completely crushing. So that is the purpose of why I'm showing you this because you have to be very flexible in chess. You have to understand that time is in and of itself a very valuable commodity. Completely winning for white, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the correction, Nikola. Okay, back to the speed run and back to the last game because I know everybody's anxious for me to play more. Okay. Um, so that's actually one of my favorite games. Now in this game, he played a French. And just to uh, recap, f6 is, I, I mean, I think this is a mistake uh, because, whoops, because c5 here is the main move attacking the base of the pawn chain. We, we've already faced this once. E takes f6, now we've got a weak square on e5, but we don't occupy it immediately, we don't rush. We don't rush because he can take our knight. And um, Aaron Nimzovich, who I've referenced several times, he, he calls the situation like a visit to the dentist, right? you're letting black visit the dentist and fill his cavity like the pawn on e5 is is a filling you don't want to let your opponent fill fill his cavities right you want to put a piece on a weak square not necessarily a pawn bit of a not an example i think anybody needed especially people like eating ice cream right now thank you scruffy rodent but you get the point i think it's actually a pretty effective example okay um Rookie, well, this I, I didn't think of this analogy that was nimzik okay i really I, I recuse myself from this thank you nephew for uh Gifting two tier one subs to the community, Tyler Mandel and Sultan. Okay, so rookie one attacking the pawn. Everything we did here was very obvious up until this moment. This is the e5 square that we want to occupy. This is the bishop that is defending it. 
we ask ourselves the next logical question codex thank you so much and since and i can't even keep up with these subs two months from sunfish codex with eight months thank you so much this square on e5 is defend we want to get rid of the bishop how do we get rid of the bishop well we have a bishop of our own can we put it on f4 no we cannot can we prepare the move bishop f4 we can but the problem with something like this is going to be this ruins our pawn structure near our king i don't want that so what we do a nephew himself summon we get our bishop from g5 all the way back to g3 okay and i can show you a million examples where where something like this happens i can pull out examples from some of my own games i think um i'm not sure if i can remember i, I think i can remember one from the top of my head but i mean this is this is very typical again i'm not trying to to sell to play myself off as oh i have all these games to show you this is truly very typical and here we go well not exactly the same thing um but but you get the points um and and let me just go back to the chess base scene this is a game ah, chess base is not made for streaming so i have to keep changing stuff uh, but but it's worth it thank you for being so patient all right okay we're good this is my game against varakobian from the 2011 us championship it was a french it was a different line of the french but the same thing happened the e5 square is weakened and um bishop g5 bishop h4 and bishop g3 so and the point of this i've already taken his bishop but i'm still transferring my bishop to reinforce my control over that e5 square so this is stuff again that actually happens you know in real life um back to the speed run quote unquote speed run here we do the same thing we get our bishop there instead he loses his patience he allows our knight to get to e5 and then he goes knight g6 and here of course as i explained during the game we're trying to take on g6 t9 k as i explained we're trying to trade his bishop in order to free up the c5 square um so we're trying to take this pawn on g6 and uh deliver checkmate on f7 which he misses he has ways of defending with rook h6 and to the point of flexibility we don't stubbornly get our bishop back to g3 how do we change our plans dynamically in the context of attacking this pawn bishop g5 is correct he's completely busted because he can't move his rook he's just lost here i mean he's going to lose a lot of pieces what happens if they move their bishop back after we move our bishop back well that then then we succeed right if he doesn't do this and if he goes whatever empty move and if he goes bishop e7 we've succeeded right we can now get our knight to e5 scot-free i'm not actually saying that this is the best idea but i want people to understand that i'm not doing everything because it's the best i'm trying to illustrate create instructive ideas uh, so people can file uh, file them away and apply them that doesn't mean i personally would always do this kind of stuff seth morgan io thank you for the tier one why not knight c3 and then knight b5 well knight c3 would be pretty easy to prevent that's really the only reason but this would be very very uh very good plan as well uh th this idea is just harder to prevent because th this pathway is is just impossible to stop 